Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to Balaton Musical, uh, the music studio. If you've never been here before, we're very glad to have you here with us this afternoon. Uh, we present, free of charge, nothing's ever of any cost here, um, to the public, limited seating, in a studio environment, your opportunity to be part of a recording session. So just like they say on television, record it live in front of a studio audience, you are that studio audience. So sometimes there are classical um, groups that perform. Today we have jazz. I won't go into the etymology of the word jazz because there are children under 35 in this audience. <laughs> Yeah, that's speculation anyway. Nobody really knows. But today, um, I'm here as a volunteer and as a financial contributor to La Atelier Musica. It's as listed up there, although the website, you will see the L and apostrophe is absent, and it's dot .art. Uh, and if you'd like to visit the website and find out more about what we do here, and how you can contribute either financially or as a volunteer. You can certainly visit there or talk to any of us who have been around for a while, me or Patrick or any of the other people that are here, if you'd like to become involved. And if you'd like to make a contribution today, we have this little pink box. <laughs> and you can put money in it. <laughs> and uh, we always appreciate being able to defray the cost of the appearances of the people that come here the wonderful musicians who play here throughout the season, and um, um, that would help. So there will be refreshments after this. We're going to do one set today without an intermission, and I'll have this out as I pour refreshments for people a little bit later on. So do feel free to make a contribution if you'd like to. We very much appreciate it. Today it's the Mark Dresser Trio with Denman Moroni on hyper piano. Do you know what a hyper piano is? Well, I have no idea. <laughs> <laughs> and Matthias Zietler on a wonderful collection of flutes, as you can see. And I'm looking forward to that very much, too. Mark Dresser's Grammy nominated. It's played with Anthony Braxton, with Stanley Crouch, and a long list of other collaborators. And people over the years that he's been playing. So I hope you give them a very warm welcome and have a wonderful time this afternoon. We're very glad you're here.
that piece was the very first piece that we performed at our first concert at the Knitting Factory in New York uh, called Subtonium in 1999. And it was, uh, this trio was brought together by our mutual fascination with exploring our instruments and sound worlds and this prosthesis that I just took <laughs> off my base was a set of metal ties that my friend, uh, the luthier Kent McLagan, made for me along with this bass itself. So um, as the years go on, we keep uh, each, of, uh, each of us in our own different ways, uh, keep exploring our, our instruments and bringing new aspects of uh, instrumental and musical vocabulary to the, to the table. Um, so uh, we'd like to continue, uh, as I was, we'd like to continue with a piece called Between 17th and Bliss, and I can't help but tell the, a little bit about the story of this. Uh, during um, our, this whole affair, this whole concert is, is on so many levels, is, is based on friendship. I've known Demon since the late 80s, uh, Matthias since the 90s, and I met Patrick Loray, oh gosh, I don't know the exact year, but it's probably around the 2000s, somewhere around there. 2003, he just held up the fingers. And I met him through a, an amazing singer named Alexandra Montano, and at the time, uh, Alexandra, uh, they were dating, and they eventually got married, and tragically, she had an early demise but we did a re recording together, uh, Dem and myself, with Alexandra and a wonderful drummer that I'll be playing with uh, on uh, the 29th of this month with this trio with drummer Michael Serene. So, but, so the, going back to the title, Between 17th and Bliss, was the name of the street that uh, Alexandra had, had a home. And... Um, and so I just thought, well, that, you know, of course it was 17th to 47th Avenue or something like that. And, uh, but it had a secondary name like so many streets in New York to do. And I thought, and it was Bliss, and I thought that was pretty funny. And, but so we used that title as the tune, and we recorded this on a recording called Time Changes. So uh, this is the first time we've played it with Matthias. And here we are, you know, the circle comes back again. So uh, I hope you enjoy it. Thank mm -hmm. you. 
with a piece by Demma Moroni entitled Pulse Field. Do you want to say anything in front of this? A pulse field is a field of pulses, different times that happen together and form a composite rhythm. And we play a couple of these in a composed form and then we improvise on that form. Thank you. 
Okay, um, we're going to move on with a, uh, a piece called Evaporative Measure. What year did we do uh, aquifer? What about aquifer? Aquifer. What year did we record that? We, anyhow, we had a whole thing. We had an unofficial title called the Moisture Project. And uh, we, our, our CD was called, uh, um, was called Aquifer. It's, it's our only uh, trio CD was recorded on a wonderful label called Cryptogramophone. And, uh, and during this period, this idea of what we call the piece of evaporative measure, and it's both, it, it, it re relates to the metaphor of evaporation, of course, but really what it's about is really rhythmic permutations. So the way I compose, in a sense, is sometimes there, there are um, uh, ideas that are pushing musical agendas. Other times they're dedications to people, like as in uh, Between 17th and Bliss, and, uh, and Subtonium was, or sometimes they have sonic agendas. So, but this one, Anyhow, there were all these musical things that we were trying to do and also have different ways of improvising that weren't cyclical forms necessarily. So there are certain things, because in, in, in the jazz canon, typically we improvise on a song form that repeats with the same harmony. This is obviously, you can already tell we're not doing that. So, but what we do here is three or four different strategies of different kinds of improvising and using different kinds of rhythmic structures to create opportunities for exploration.
it's a, it's a conundrum. Uh, we have this, this amazing opportunity to perform for the first time as a trio since before the pandemic. This is the first time we perform in person since 2016. However, we did perform in 2020 virtually using this technology called telematic, uh, telematic technology. It's basically a high bandwidth, uh, low latency Zoom. That's just for a, so you can, we can play in real time with high quality sound. We did that in 2020, but it's beautiful and a joy for us to be able to play in person for you, to be in the same room together, uh, you know, and rehearse and, uh, you know, uh, anyhow, um, but the, the conundrum is, it's a recording session, but it's a performance and I can't help but honor the performance, though I do want to do that piece again. <laughs> so what I'd like to do, or I could do it the second set. Okay, we'll do, I'll tell you what, we'll, we'll do it again in our second set because we have pieces that uh, we're not repeating any pieces except Mark? now. Yes. Sorry, no, do it now while you're in. Okay, so let me make, okay, so a little, little band talk right now. Okay, so um, thank you, Patrick. So um, I dug it, but uh, uh, Matthias and Devin, the, co the collective uh, space at 27? Yes. Let's X that out and go right to 28. As you can hear, there are lots of little different grooves that go on. And then we have these open expanses. So we're going to excise that. Okay? So from 27, we'll go right into 28, and you got the solo. And do, oh, not, res yeah. and do not resolve until you're done, and then we'll do that thing. And then, and then, and finally, remember that um, when we do, it's only two times to the at the very end before we do the recap. Thirty-nine. The fifteen eight. The fifteen eight. Yes. It's only two times. Yes. Okay. Other than that, <laughs> this is like this. any questions? <laughs> Why? Why? Okay. So.
Anyhow, it's, uh, thank you. I uh, haven't done that before. So.
So we'd like to conclude this set uh, with a piece that originally uh, came from a piece that I had the, the honor to write for Matthias Ziegler in 1994. He commissioned me to write a, a piece featuring the whole family of flutes and string quartet. And as a, as a bone, he said, add bass. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, so I got a chance to play too. So uh, this, the, the last movement of the, of the piece, which was called the banquet, every, the last one after the end of the banquet, you have the digestivo, right? So this piece is called digestivo. <laughs> and... Uh, <laughs>
So anyway, we're we're, we're gonna we're, we're gonna don't, don't worry about it. don't don't listen. We're gonna. Okay, so I, I'm going to I'm, I'm gonna stroll a little bit and then I'll give you a nice clean cue. Okay. I take I take full responsibility. questions or ask any questions we're happy to field them uh, anything yes what I'll makes the hyper piano hyper <laughs> oh dear player it's just a word um, when I started doing this I called it um, unprepared piano but this was in the time when John Cage was preparing piano, and I wanted to distinguish what I do from what he did. Uh, but then people started using the phrase to refer to the piano that's not at all like what John Cage does. So I felt I needed a new word, and I came up with that. I didn't trademark it, unfortunately, so if you <coughs> Google it, you can find other people. There's even an instrument now uh, that's been invented, which is called the hyperpiano. And there may be a couple of others. But I did it first. Bravo. <laughs> Anything else? I wanted to ask you about your bass. Yeah. You tell us about it. Okay, this was made for me by the luthier Kent McLagan uh, from Denver, Colorado. And it's got a, f um, well, obviously it's not a traditional color. It's a maple top. Uh, well, the, you know, the, the, no, the back is maple, which is very traditional, but this uh -huh. is in strips of maple. See that we have a, 
Uh, Bob Krasniski's here is a, a, a fine luthier in the area. I'm told he's a bad dude. That's what, I, that's what the, uh, by the in crowd tells me. So this is, this is strips of maple, which all string instruments are made of because it's hard reflexive wood. And my friend Kent uh, carves these out of strips. And then, and then the, uh, the top is made out of Engelhart spruce, which is, you know, which is native, non-endangered, nothing's coming from the black forest. The sides, which I find really beautiful, are made out of uh, sycamore. Oh, I see it's open here, okay. Uh, uh, and then on top of that, uh, what's really unusual here is there's a trap door here. So, and the idea is that if you have a, uh, if you take away these screws instead of the traditional method of getting a sound post and doing this really arcane but time-honored tradition of fitting a sound post, which in Italian means, it's called l'anima, which means the soul, uh, and you go through this kind of baroque process of finding the exact place and you use mirrors uh, and it's very, but Kent, say, who's, a, who's an engineer and a very good bass player and who has an ear of acoustician said, well, that does, you know, this is much more practical if I do, if this have a door and then he has it measured like by the millimeters, like completely gridded out. So uh, it's just having a, you know, and then um, what else can I tell you about that? The, 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 the also, I call this an eco base because it's totally, you know, not, not sustainable wood. So the, the fingerboard, instead of being the tr traditional time-honored material of ebony, which is endangered, this is made out of ipe, which is also a Brazilian uh, hardwood. It's actually, I'm told it's harder than, um, than, uh, mm -hmm. than ebony, thank you. But it's, um, you know, for the ebony fingerboard, it's cost about $100 for a blank. More, 150, 200? Okay, <laughs> over $200 for a blank fingerboard. For $40, you can get a, 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 a plank of this and get four fingerboards out of it. And it works, I love it. It's because it, it does all the things that I want as a Make all those bi-tone sound, which for, you know, a normative bass player, I won't say normal, but uh, would be, uh, you, you wouldn't necessarily want that. But that, would, for me, adds detail that I, I love. So, and then he has other, yeah, the, yeah so that's the, that's the story. And then on top of that, he has magnetic pickups that are built into the fingerboard. So four hand-wound magnetic pickups, four up here and four in the middle of the fingerboard. And this is a... Uh, up until 2000, uh, uh, I had used, from 83 to 2000, I had basically uh, something on, uh, two bass guitar pickups mounted on a piece of wood that's strapped on with a capo that's suspended over the, the nut, and it picked up those same frequencies that now I can... <laughs> string I can get three different sounding pitches which is wild but it's also like how do you how do you t how do you tune it how do you think about it what's the fundamental it's taken me years to be able to, to really get a, a system to be able to organize all of that and finally I do because it doesn't mean that it's it, it I, I, I know what I'm doing more than I ever have I'll just say that so Kent's offered me that then he made those times which I showed you uh, yeah, so it's, uh, it's just, you know, to work with, you know, as I say, the, you know, this music is very collaborative. I couldn't do this with just anybody. It's definitely made for Matthias and Denman. No one else has th these vocabularies. And that's really exciting. That's sort of, I sort of think that, um, that this is, this is kind of like the Duke Ellington tradition. You write for people of personality and character, and you make your music around that. I feel lucky enough to have, have with these guys and collaborating for 20 years or more. We're pushing much more. Anyhow, so <laughs> let's not do the math. But, but the, 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 un the undersung collaboration is with the luthiers who make, they're the people who facilitate our advancement. Without your art, we can't push the envelope. 
And, and this has been, you know, you think of all the great bass players in the jazz tradition, you think of Scott LaFaro, that could have not happened without, I mean, he, he would have been great no matter what. But the, what uh, Samuel Colstein, the, the noted luthier in Long Island, was able to do, set up a bass in a new way that had never been conceived for to facilitate a player who had never, who played with a conception that had never been heard before. So this thing, this, the thing between luthier and player, is really an undersung story, and our you know our our, uh, our advancement is really a, a partnership. Now, Matthias, were these instruments made especially for you? Uh, yes, uh, my my Lucia is living in Holland, <laughs> northern Holland. It's uh, her name is Eva Kigma, and uh, that's that's uh, you know we usually discuss the flutes and my what I wish to have, and it's actually a bass flute which has a different shape. Mm -hmm. And um, usually the bass flute turns around once and you hold it up out here. Yep. And with this flute, I have ma many more possibilities. And um, when, we, when we showed this the first time at the flute convention in San Diego, mm -hmm. people said, oh, that's, that looks like a Hoover. <laughs> <laughs> And since then it has the nickname Hoover, so I'm playing that Hoover. <laughs> and we have, um, the specialty is that I've built in microphones, and similar to what Mark has uh, in his fingerboard. There are a whole handful of uh, electronic people that you've collaborated to, how to you know, and put the microscope to these small sounds. Was no. Hans Martin? Uh, um, the guy who worked with Andreas Vollenweider? Yeah, I've been uh, lucky to be on tour with Andreas Vollenweider for longer than a year. And, um, and Hanse, Han, and now we call him, <laughs> he has a nickname with us. His technician, main technician, helped me uh, to do this. And it um, was incredible what, how much that's about the fourth generation of amplification I have, you yeah. know. And I wanted to ask them, you know, any, any question I had, I could ask him. Yeah. Uh, that, so that was, was really, uh, yeah, Hans-Peter Ersam was yeah. his name. And, you know, what I did basically, I go closer to the instrument with my ear, and I hear all kind of, you hear this, you know. But I always didn't match my aesthetics, you know, so I felt like... music for those reasons because I felt like the aesthetics of those sounds maybe it's it's for pop aesthetics in sound so I wanted to taking magnifying glass and going very close to the instrument so the extension on the mouthpiece is that it, it seems as though that much that you know the, the curvature um, yeah the, yeah I mean it seems as though that extends the sound that uh, no, it's just a question of proportion. So if you have to go around the curve, you you have to place it at a certain at a at, at a one point uh, to make it acoustically right. <coughs> so it was a long thing to. This is cylindrical. The flute is conical. Uh, if you have the curve up here, that's also a flute by Eva Kingma. That curve has to be conical. And to build a conical curve, that's really a, but a, really I, a difficult thing. Am I wrong? This aspect that you're speaking about is more ergonomically motivated rather than sonic. Okay. I see. Yeah. yeah. That. Oh, yeah. yeah. That the curve comes here is it, it's still a it's still a, a traverso flute, you know, because mm -hmm. it starts here like any flute, and and then it goes its way. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Ah. And what about the the bigger one? The bigger one is the, the contrabass flute, which basically has the same... Uh, the same 
same uh, possibilities that you get the key clicks. I mean, that's a, that's a close word to what Mike is doing on his fingerboard. So those are the areas where we meet or when Denman is playing inside the piano with this rubber uh, plow, you know, <laughs> like kind of finding the pitches. And so this is where we meet. And, um, you could, I don't know, any com if any composer could really think of the, those, of the, those elements, you know. It would be a nightmare for a composer to compose their own. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And, and often how we develop the stuff is like we'll improvise and then we'll find something that was really special and, and we'll say, what the hell was that? Mm -hmm. um, Demon and I spent, we used to meet weekly when I lived in New York and we would play duo and we would, when things got really good, we would, and this is really hard, we'd stop ourselves and try to identify what, what piece of new vocabulary and we'd give it a name. And then by the, that process, we started to catalog it. We didn't have to write it down. Sometimes we recorded ourselves, but more often than not, we just cataloged it. And it was a really functional way to develop stuff so it wasn't just lost in the ether. And Matthias and I have worked Similarly, and now with this uh, telematic technology, which is the ability to play at distance, um, uh, Matthias and I have been able to play uh, a fair amount together over the during the, even before the pandemic. Mm -hmm. So, uh, the, with uh, the um, availability of high bandwidth network, which now fortunately is available to basically any consumer who can afford a gigabit of bandwidth, you can really do professional level performances, low latency. And uh, I'm a teacher at UC San Diego. Up until the pandemic, that was not the case. You had to be at research universities. So like in 2009, we did this project called Deep Tones for Peace. So I had uh, 13 bass players, 11, like with seven and four, Eight, seven in Jerusalem and five in New York City. We, and we had to get like, we had to pipe in uh, the, the special bandwidth to the venue in Jerusalem, and and the bass players at uh, in New York were at NYU, where they had a learning lab where they had that high bandwidth. Now that's you could you could do it a lot of different places that had that level of wired internet. And the fact of the matter is that it's just getting better and better. So this will be ubiquitous. The, the, the pity, from my point of view, that, that one of the things that was beautiful, I, that's a hard, I, just, I hate to say this, the beautiful thing about the pandemic was that it made musicians, because out of necessity, play across distance, because we needed to play and do things. The thing is, is that that is really a, a sustainable, ecologically smart way to perform. And after having done this for over a decade, I know personally that it does not impact intimacy, connection, at all. Because it's sort of like, the thing is like playing in a, st if we were doing a real recording session, this is sort of like a hybrid, I might be in a booth, for example. So that means that I wouldn't really be hearing Matthias or Demon, I'd be listening to headphones. So I'm hearing the details of what they're playing. I'm not feeling the, their perspiration because I can hear the details, not only of what they're playing, but what I'm playing, it makes me play differently with a level of accuracy that I'm sure I didn't play with today, because I, I went for the jugular, because that's just what happens when you perform for people. So, uh, but I, I do see that as a, future, as a future for live performance. Now, people are so attached to being in the same room, and I, you know, what's better than this? It's, it's human, it's content, but, you know, we all talk on the phone, we have lots of meaningful human connections, right? And you hear something in someone's voice that belies seeing them in person at that. You can tell if someone's upset just in the timbre of their voice. So it's kind of like that. It offers other potentials. Okay, I sound like a televangelist or something. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much. Yeah. What did you do in, inside the piano? I couldn't, I couldn't see. Uh, How did you play well, it with the chords? I had to, I had to um, 
use the sustain pedal, but I couldn't do that from back there. So I wedged a chisel in the sustain pedal to keep it to keep the dampers off the string. And then I just um, bowed across the string. Did you use different, anything different or was places. it your hands? And I used um, some ancient technology to see the jewel case. Uh, I think that's the only tool I used. Oh, and maybe I was going across and maybe towards the end I went in a, a sliding as opposed yeah, to wonderful. bowing. And because all the strings are in the same plane, when I bow, I get a cluster of yes. notes. Yeah. Were you using the copper bar as well to this? Uh, I used it, but not on that, not on that first piece. Okay. Oh. So uh, here's this, several this is a piece of copper that I use okay. also for bowing and sliding. So like up here. Copper because copper is softer than steel, and that copper or brass is what's used to wind the strings. And I also use it as a slide. Come soft. I'm just sliding against the string just like Mark does, and you know, sliding up and down the fingerboard. And like him, this is part of our connection. And when I slide, I hear the sound emanating from both sides of the tool that I'm touching the string with, right? So if I go this way. The short end is getting longer, which means the pitch is going down, and the long end is getting shorter, which means that the, the long, the low pitch is going up, right? And if I get to the middle, then they, then they make a unison. And that's exactly what we, we share that. for the first time I said oh man <laughs> yeah he has he has a mic to help amplify yeah. what's on the upside of, of where he's touching right the, the bass, bass is designed to, to sound at the bottom the on the part of the string that's below where he's touching right I don't have that I have I always get both sides whether I want them or not right. but that's okay I like that <laughs> and also because there's two strings three strings per note in this register if I rotate the thing around, I get a different combination. If I do it straight across, it's, let's see. There, that's the center. And, and uh, the tool is straight across the three strings. But if I rotate it, and if I turn the tool, instead of this way, if I do it this way, then it's even more dramatic. same place. I didn't move this way. I just did like this. Yeah. So there's lots of ways to play one note. I'm sure. And then I have uh, other tools like I have uh, some rubber tools and more plastic tools and that's just to change the timbre. But the basic approach is the same. Thank Patrick Duray and Sabrina for hosting us and this uh, wonderful uh, venue here. Uh, it's really been a pleasure. Yeah, and, and you, you perceive 